George Floyd's death, it catalyzed a global movement against police brutality and for black lives. And, uh, you know, for the first time, you can really see that this opened the eyes of a lot of uh, white Americans who, for the first time, were finally getting to see firsthand what black and brown communities have been saying about the police for decades. I mean, police were shameless and brazen, using chemical weapons against peaceful protesters left and right in numerous viral videos. They were pepper spraying soccer moms. And all of this is going to open their eyes. It's going to leave a lasting mark on them. But now that the case that catalyzed that movement has uh, seemingly come to an end, at least as far as Derek Chauvin is con uh, concerned, since he's going to be uh, going to prison, I don't want those folks who were awakened to think that this is the end of it. Because what happened to George Floyd and the conviction of Derek Chauvin, this is actually an anomaly. And the fact that there's justice in this case, in this instance, doesn't necessarily mean that it was a victory. Everyone in the streets uh, who marched for the first time, this isn't actually the victory. And we may want a victory. We might feel like this is a victory, but in actuality, it's not a victory. And until black Americans are no longer killed by the police, until the police officers who actually... Uh, who kill black and brown people are held accountable until the system is dismantled. The fight has to continue. And I want to read an article from the Huff Post, which really does a phenomenal job at explaining why it's the case that this Derek Chauvin conviction really is an exception to the rule. It, it truly is an anomaly. So Jessica Schulberg explains the fact that Chauvin was arrested and charged was itself unusual. Each year, police shoot and kill roughly 1,000 people, according to the Washington Post, which has been tracking fatal shootings by on-duty police officers since 2015. But between the beginning of 2005 and June of 2019, just 104 non-federal law enforcement officers have been arrested on murder or manslaughter charges related to an on-duty shooting researchers at Bowling Green State University found. And of those 104 officers who were arrested, only only 35 were convicted of a crime, 15 pleaded guilty, and 20 were convicted by a jury. Chauvin's conviction, therefore, was an anomaly. Even when police officers are convicted of killing, it is rarely on murder charges. Instead, 31 of those 35 convictions were for lesser charges, including manslaughter, negligent homicide, and reckless discharge of a firearm. Those charges generally carry more lenient sentences than a murder conviction. Racism is a key reason why, in America, police officers rarely face criminal punishment when they take another person's life. Black people are more than twice as likely as white people to be killed by the police, and white jurors may empathize less with a black victim. And although public trust in the police is at its lowest point in decades, there are still plenty of Americans who are inclined to trust a law enforcement officer's narrative and, if put on a jury, would be reluctant to convict a cop. Even jurors who aren't enthusiastically pro-law enforcement may vote not to convict because of a cop's broad legal authority to kill. In the 1980s, the Supreme Court established that police officers are allowed to use deadly force if they believe their life or the lives of others are in danger, even if evidence shows that there was never any threat. Timothy Lohman, the police officer who in 2014 shot and killed 12-year-old Tamir Rice, had reason to fear for his life, prosecutor Timothy McGinty claimed at the time after a grand jury decided against indictment. It would have been unreasonable to expect the police officer to wait and see if the young boy's toy gun was real, McGinty said. So I really want folks to understand that there were very unique circumstances in the Derek Chauvin case that really, it sets it apart from other cases. So usually the defense, as was stated in that article that police officers use, is they had to discharge a deadly firearm because they feared for their life uh, or the lives of others. But you can't, you can't really make that argument and convince people if you have your knee on a man's neck for nine minutes. You just can't do it. So what the defense had to rely on in the case of Derek Chauvin was uh, this idea that it wasn't necessarily the knee on George Floyd's neck that killed him. Rather, it was other things, possibly a substance. But of course, that's that's not persuasive. We all saw the video. I don't think that you even have to argue in court that the knee on his neck 
was what killed him. I think that's pretty obvious, right? But I mean, we have due process and the rule of law. But I mean, that's the reason why Derek Chauvin couldn't use the general argument of, I, I think that my life might have been uh, in jeopardy, which is why I had to kill that person, because this was a very different case. So understand that because there was justice in this case doesn't necessarily mean that there will be justice going forward. This isn't going to be a moment where the floodgates open and more and more cops go to jail for killing black and brown Americans. That's, that's not what's going to happen, unfortunately. The way we get that to happen is we have to dismantle the current system, reimagine policing in America. And this is why, regardless of how you want to phrase it, defunding the police is what you have to do. You can call it whatever you want to call it, reallocating resources away from the police. But what we have to do is reimagine policing in America rather than responding to all issues in society with the one-size-fits-all approach and just throwing police at it. Maybe instead of calling the police, we call a social worker to deal with someone who's suffering from mental illness. Maybe we uh, call people who specialize uh, in, in child psychology to deal with uh, children who are being violent. It doesn't have to be police that you throw at every single situation. I mean, policing in America has led to us becoming a police state jailing more folks per capita than any other major country. When you treat the issue of homelessness as a criminal issue, when you treat drug use and sex work as criminal issues, we're going to create a situation in society where we do have a police state, where police officers do basically rule over you know a population that is subordinate to them. And that's not the way that this is supposed to be. In an ideal world, the police are supposed to protect society. Right, they're, they're public servants, but that's not ha what's happening. If you look at some of these cities, it's like they're an occupying military. So it's not like this case, you know, the justice wasn't good. It's not like we shouldn't celebrate that. That's not what I want the takeaway to be. But what I am saying is that if you're new to this, if your eyes were just opened up, then now is where we keep pressing further. You don't stop. You don't use this as evidence to call it quits. You keep going and acknowledge how rare this conviction is because usually this does not happen. And there's a reason why lots of folks, myself included, were very anxious and uh, were worried about the verdict because even if there was a video of what happened, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to lead to a conviction because we've seen time and again that that's not enough. That's not enough for reasons laid out in this article. But I just want folks to understand this is the beginning. And this is why some folks don't feel like this really is a victory. I mean, it is a victory. There's justice for George Floyd and his family, but he still doesn't get his life back. And the true victory will be changing the system so a life is never taken again, where we don't have to beg for justice for the victim of police brutality in the first place.